everybody. Um, this is Veronica Rosenfeld, CEO of Eurise Movement. When you clearly know who you are and what is very next for you, you rise to your greatness and step to your destiny. And for all of you guys here on a mastermind, I always let you know that it's going to be recorded and it's going to be on a YouTube with the next few weeks. So um, why is so well? All of you guys are welcome to Eurise Clarity Mastermind and what it's all about. It's about connecting the most brilliant minds together. And it's about to create clarity because each of us, we all sitting somewhere, we know street number, city, and the zip code. And as we know, sitting, we know where we are, we know how to get there. But many of us, many of us, uh, when it comes to business and life, we don't know exactly what it looks like. And we want to arrive there five minutes early without having idea what the address looks like. That's why I'm so eminent about creating clarity. So this group is designed just to talk on every uh, on different topics and clarity. So today is going to be sales, curiosity, and clarity with Martin Lopez. And um, let me tell you, usually I have bio of people, and I don't have it with Martin, but I have happened to know Martin for a while. So Martin is one of the kindest human beings. His, his gift is truly to connect with people. He's been in mortgages and in real estate all his life, like 30 years, right? More, 35? Yeah, 34 years. 30, 35 years this year. Yeah. He has an uh, amazing family and he's been living in San Diego. So what I love about Martin, Martin has ability. He's one of those people who knows everybody. And he has ability to build a relationship with everybody. And I think what this mastermind going to be today is about how building your relationship because your network is your network and if anybody who knows how to do it well it's martin because even today like certain people who don't usually comment on my stuff they comment on martin's stuff <laughs> and, uh, and because martin has the gift of relationship so martin the floor is yours well, thank you. Hi, everybody. How you doing? So I'd like to get to know who's here right now. We got Jeremiah. Hey, Jeremiah. How you doing, brother? First time I've ever seen you live. I usually see you, your pictures. And congratulations on your book and all that. Yeah. Nancy, hey, I got you're to awesome. You. I believe in your dreams. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. And Nancy, thank you. I met you. And ZL, I don't know who that is, but hey, ZL, how you doing? Um, so you said a couple things, and so I'd like to kind of address what you were talking about. Um, but I can tell you, and, and I'll kind of like jump around a little bit if you don't mind. Um, first off, I'd like to, Veronica, I'd like to thank you for, um, you know, first off, the work you do, um, uh, just the, the personal work you do as you do it on, like, have you done it for me, on me? And that's been like life transforming. That's uh, been shifting. And it's really kind of been, and I have never thanked you publicly for that, but I want to take a second and do that right now. And you know, really what it, what's been like is I, I feel like I was kind of like maybe walking in the door one way. And after working with you, it was like, it wasn't a door anymore. It was just like, everything was gone. It was, and it was just like, everything was possible. And the way that I related to the world just shifted like in the moment it, and, and like I haven't gone back. And that's, what's really cool because a lot of people that you can work with, um, what they'll do is they'll, is they will um, they'll work with you. And then two days later, you know, you find yourself like five steps back because of like all the emotional stuff. But I found with you, the, uh, the fact that you cleared out what was in the way that I didn't have to step back into that again. So that's really, really cool. So thank you for that. Well, I never really worked with you, but thank you. We were, we were, we were friends. So there is people who, I have speakers who have been working like Nancy knows Brian and other people, but with, with Martin, we've never been really, like we just become friends more than anything else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and 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 I, and and I know that you've liked all the stuff that you've told me and all that stuff that you helped me with a lot of stuff. So thank you. Well, Martin is one. Martin, we, Martin was one of the earliest people. He met me when I was. I didn't, <laughs> she always says this. <laughs> I didn't have the company yet, and I would come and I would do those things. So he saw my evol, evol, evolution yeah, through the process where I actually can finally say what I do. With, without blinking and it, it took me like two and a half years yeah um, and that we all have that we all have that and even in my even what i'm doing veronica there's a it's there's sometimes it's tough for me to even say what i'm doing and what i'm about 
because the curiosity theory, which is the book that I wrote, really encompasses everything. There's like nothing that curiosity can't make a difference in or it can't tap you into. If we want to do anything in life, you know, as we explore it, as we explore the things we want to do in our life, that what the biggest tool that we can have to explore is curiosity because that has us be open-minded. It has us, you know, be have, you know, leave judgment uh, on the other side, just leave it away. And then we can just start to explore and see what it is we want to create. And then it opens up, uh, us up for connecting with other people. So um, one of the things you said is, is Martine could build a relationship with anybody and, uh, funny as I was talking to a friend of mine today about that and she was saying how do you do that and I said I think it came out of me being nosy as a child I think I've always been kind of nosy and about people and I kind of always stuck my nose in places that maybe I didn't it didn't belong but um, but I was but I always meant well like I always wanted to try to help people even if people didn't ask me and as a result I think that kind of made me a curious person without me knowing and then um, about two Two and a half year, three about three and a half years ago, um, I wrote the book The Curiosity Theory, and it came out. I wrote it as a complete accident. And what happened was I was driving home from from work. It was a Friday afternoon, about three o'clock, three fifteen. And my wife, she works uh, as a school teacher, and she had just gotten home, and she was tired, but we wanted to go out and have some, have a good time, maybe have dinner, have some drinks, maybe do a little dancing, listen to some music. And I just, I, I work very, very close. It's less than four or five minutes from here. And it's just, I live just a couple of minutes from the beach here in San Diego. And um, I was driving home and I was having one of those phone calls that you have with your spouse or your significant other where you're trying to figure out what you want to eat. And so it's, it goes kind of like this, hey, honey, so where do you want to go? And she's like, honey, I'll go anywhere you want to go. And I say, okay, how about uh, pho, you know, that Vietnamese noodles. Every Friday, I have my team that we, you know, we have our meetings and we go and we eat the Vietnamese noodles. But that Friday, we didn't, we, didn't, we just didn't go and, and have noodles that, that Friday. And so I was like craving for some noodles. And there's OB Noodle House, and we don't, you know, want to go there. And she's like, yeah, nah, that's okay. That, that, you know, no, that's not something. I said, okay, well, no problem. Well, well, where would you like to go? Well, anywhere you want to go. I'm like, okay. Um, how about Italian food? Hmm. No, nah, well, okay. Where would you like to go? Anywhere you want to go. It's getting get a little frustrated. So how about Mexican? Because there's Old Town is a, a little town right around the corner from us. It's a little area where they have a lot of Mexican restaurants here in San Diego. And I said, how about Old Town? We'll go down to Old Town Mex and, you know, get a couple of tacos, have some margaritas, usually have some music there. You know, some mariachis are playing. Yeah, I don't really feel like Mexican food. So by this time I'm, I'm pulling up, you know, I'm getting really close to home. I live on top of a hill. So I'm driving up the hill and got my phone on and I'm kind of talking around the phone with my headset and I just hang the phone up. It's like, I'm frustrated. I'm like, forget it. You know, I get home. I walk through the front door right here and she's like, did you hang up on me? I'm like, no, I didn't hang up on you. You hung up on me. No, I didn't hang up on you. You hung up on me. Five minutes later, I'm sitting on the couch watching ESPN and my wife's in the bedroom on her iPad playing crossword puzzles. And it's Friday around, like I said, around 3.30 now. And I'm just like frustrated. So I'm going to go down to the beach. Like I said, I'm just a, you know, a couple minutes from the beach. So I get in my car and I start going down to the beach. And as I'm, as I'm driving to the beach, I'm like finishing the fight with my wife. And I'm you know, kind of going through what happened and thinking, you know, all you had to do is say this and we'd be you know, eating dinner and everything would be fine. We'd have a drink and we'd be like at the beach and everything's really cool. And, but she didn't do that. So I'm kind of like going through this whole argument with her and I realize she's not there. I'm like kind of a little embarrassed, you know, like, all right. And um, I kind of just see myself arguing, like trying to win a fight. And by this time I'm at the beach and I, um, I was looking for my journal. This is my journal. I journal all the time. So I'm always, I'm always journaling and I, I get to the beach, but I don't have my journal. So what I do when I, what I do when I do journal though, is I'll write a, uh, I'll write a question mark and then I'll write the question I'm trying to work on. So, you know, why are we fighting? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, why are we fighting? So I get to the beach and I'm, and I, you know, I'm at the sand and I put a question mark in the sand and I, you know, I'm thinking, why are we fighting? Like what, you know, like what happened? Why are we fighting? And I'm just walking up and down the beach. And as I, as I get probably about a half mile to a mile, something hits me like this memory that hits me that when I was a kid, you know, did you have memories, Nancy and Jeremiah, like when you were a little kid, like you have memories and they just are there always like when things happen. 
I had this memory when I was in eighth grade. And when I was in eighth grade, I hung out with these two guys. One of them was named Mark, and the other one was John. And Mark was kind of a shorter guy, and he kind of had like that Bruce Lee look, you know, if you know that look with the hair and everything. And he loved karate and all that. And um, he loved to fight. And he was kind of a real feisty little guy, you know, and he'd always get John and I into fights. And, uh, and then John, on the other hand, was a lot bigger than us. He was, he was way bigger than, than Mark and me. And I think that he probably was supposed to be a couple grades up because in the eighth grade, he had a full goatee. I mean, this guy, you know, he wasn't supposed to be in eighth grade, I was pretty sure. Well, John had the kind of personality where he didn't like to fight. He really was kind of a, a, a calm guy. We used to call him Thor because he was so big. But he was also that kind of guy that when he got in a fight, he wouldn't stop. You know, that kind of person that whenever they, they're in a fight, they just don't stop until they win. That was John's style. So one day I, I'm walking into the cafeteria and I see this, this crowd of people and, and, you know, kind of like one of those crowds, like when there's a fight, you ever seen that kind of crowd? Like when there's a fight, people are acting a particular way. You ever notice that? So I, I make my way to the front of the crowd. And as I, as I get to the front of the crowd, I see, you know, Mark and John, they're fighting and they're kind of rolling around, kind of throwing some blows and stuff and nobody's stopping them. So I reach up and I pull them apart and I, and I pull Mark with my, my left hand and I pull, I push him to the ground. And I pulled John with, with my right hand, kind of like, you know, you just have a lot more strength, you know, one of those times. And as I pull him over this way, I have his shirt and I rip his shirt, but I'm still holding on to it. So now guess who I'm going to fight with? I'm going to fight with John. So now John backs up and like, I grew up in kind of a tough neighborhood. So even like the good guys had to know how to fight. I knew how to fight. I was a pretty tough guy. So John backs up and he's getting ready to hit me and all this happens within a second. So I back up and I'm getting ready to take a blow and I know I'm going to get killed because John's a lot bigger with me and he's like one of my best friends, but it's kind of like it's, he's going to hit me. I know he's going to hit me. So I'm going to defend myself and I'm going to try to get some licks in. So as I back up and I'm getting ready to take a lick, I go, John, why are we fighting? And John drops his hands and he kind of tilts his head. And he goes, I don't know. And he reaches over to Mark and he grabs Mark by the hand and they walk off. And I, my whole life, I've been wondering, like, what happened? Like, why didn't I get killed that day in the cafeteria? You know what I'm talking about, Jeremiah? You know, we all have those memories, right? Yeah, I, when I was in the military, uh, we had a, a fight up in the, this. There was bunks at uh, Fort Sam Houston. This was, uh, so this was Charlie 232nd. And I was, we were just, uh, it was a buddy of mine. His name was Latuv Ninkas. We we're all privates, you know, private huh? second class, private first class. And he, uh, he squares up on this guy. And they start fighting. We're all friends, by the way. But his friend comes around, and I'm Latuv Ninkas' friend. We go, we go at each other, and then we had, you know, we're coming at each other, and then we're like, why are we fighting? And, and I was like, do you want to fight? He said, no. Do you want to fight? I'm like, no. And then we just we stood there together and watched as those two fought. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's, it's just, well, it's one of those things where, you know, we're about to, and then we're like, why? Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. And so that's exactly what happened. So, you know, they walked off and my whole life I've been kind of wondering, like, why didn't I get my butt kicked? Like what happened that day in, in junior high school? And, you know, I thought about it and we never, ever talked about it because we were young guys. We never talked about it. Nobody ever remembered it, but it was kind of in the back of my head. And on the beach, that thought showed up. And I remember that I said, why are we fighting? And then I remembered I'm trying to figure out with Yvette, my wife, like, why are we fighting? So I guess this is really interesting. So I keep walking. I'm thinking about this. And then all of a sudden, this other memory happens when I was 30 years old, about 15 years before that. And, I, and when, I was, when I was 30 years old, I used to be in real estate. I, I'm still in real estate, but I, I used to be a real estate agent back then. And I sold this house to a couple, a, a couple and their name was um, uh, Sylvia and Hector. And, uh, and Hector was a, uh, a, uh, a PE teacher. So he was kind of like kind of, you know, a fun guy. And Sylvia, I think she was like a vice principal or something. So she was, she had a kind of a different personality, but they had bad credit and they had to, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of cash. So what we had to do is we had to fix their credit and we had to, um, and help them out with closing costs. So everybody pitched in the real estate agent, uh, um, the loan officers, the escrow company, everybody, the sellers, everybody pitched in to make this thing work. And it was, a, it was a really, really cool house. So we closed escrow on like a, it was like a Friday, uh, we closed escrow. And so what I do, I don't know if you guys are in sales, but what I do is whenever I close like a transaction, I want to make a big thing about it. 
So what I do is I'll like buy some wine, some cheese, some champagne, get like a, you know, gift certificate. And I, what I did is I went to the house before, you know, they were expecting me to be there. So I went to the house and I put it in the, in the kitchen, like on the bar, got it all set up. And Hector drove this like this loud truck, you know, one of those big monster trucks. So you can hear it coming down the street. So I hear it coming down the street. So I run outside and he pulls, they pull up, and up, up into the driveway. So I'm standing right next to him. So I'm right by the driver's door. Hector jumps out and he gives me a really big hug and says, ah, thank you, thank you, I'm so excited, so excited. And I see Sylvia get out of the truck and she walks around the front of the truck and she looks like really upset. So I figure they're probably fighting. So I'm thinking, yeah, you guys are, they're probably fighting. So we walk through the house and I have my little walk through, you know, sheet, my little check sheet. And we're going to check the bedrooms and make sure everything's good, everything's good. And then I take them into the kitchen and where I'm going to do my little sales presentation, right? So we get into the kitchen and I tell them, I said, uh, hey, Sylvia and Hector, um, your friend Elizabeth, who works with Sylvia, she um, liked what I did for her. And, she, you know, she, you know, I did a good job for her. And so what she did is she referred me to you. And all my business is pretty much by referral. So if I did, a, if I do a good job for you, you know, my, I'm hoping that you can. And before I could say refer me, her hand comes up right in my face. And she says, Martine, we won't be referring you anybody. And I'm like. Like what? I, it's one of those times you're like, what the, you know? And I see they got the champagne, I got the wine, I got the cheese, I got the $50 gift card or something like that, you know, for Home Depot. And I'm going, dude, this is like, this sucks. And I just want to get out of there. I want to take my marbles and go play with somebody else. And I'm just kind of like, I don't know what to do. I'm just kind of frozen. And I watch Hector, he looks over to Sylvia and he says, honey, something wrong? And then she starts to cry. And I'm talking like, like she's really crying. And she's like, Ever since we got our offer accepted and, and we went into escrow and we started spying the house, all I could think of is the day that I was going to get my keys and open up my front door for myself. And she looks at me and she goes, I'm sorry I didn't tell you, Martine, but when I saw you there, just all my dreams were shattered. Like I wanted to be the first person to open up my, my door and you opened it up. And I, and I was like, wow. And I just kind of sitting there trying to figure out like what to do. And I, and, I, and I looked at her and I said, well, I haven't given you the keys. And all we did is just do a walkthrough around the house. So if what you do is you go outside, I'll lock up the house. And before I could tell her that, she was gone. She left her purse on the counter. Hector grabbed the purse. He ran out following her. They got in their big, loud monster truck. They drove around the block. I locked up every door, everything. I went outside and stood by the sidewalk. And then they pull up in their big monster truck. She jumps out and gives me a big hug. And still to this day, which has been about... 24 years they still refer me people and the and and as i started to look at what happened on the beach i started to notice that i didn't get killed by john because i asked a question and that i didn't walk out of a situation that that was that i could have walked out and made a complete jerk of myself and lost the client forever but i was i witnessed hector just being incredibly empathetic and, and incredibly loving with sylvia and I started to put those two things together and I started to think that, you know, what was the thing that happened? And it was that I asked John a question and that Hector asked Sylvia a question, but it wasn't just that there was a question asked because, you know, we always ask questions, right? It's that the question really had curiosity in it. Like I really wanted to know. I really wanted to know in that moment, like, John, why are we fighting? Like I had no idea, which is like, why are we fighting? And when I saw Hector ask Sylvia, I can see he really, really wanted to know. So I'm starting to think, you know, and then I'm looking on the ground and I'm writing question marks on the ground like to try to figure out my question. It's like, boom, you know, like a little light bulb goes off like this. And it just comes to me in that moment. And I'm like, curiosity, curiosity, that's what does it. And I'm, I'm thinking about my wife at, at home and I'm thinking, let me go see if I can fix that fight. So I get in my car and I drive home and I'm starting to think about how I am, how I am as a guy. And I realized that when I was a little kid, I learned how to fight by like destroying people. So if I ever get in a fight, someone messes with me, what I do is I destroy the person because I don't want to fight again. Do you know what I'm talking about, guys? I experienced that with you at once. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's just, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a way that, it's kind of like a natural way for me that I do that. And, it's, and for a lot of guys, it's that way. Like we just, like we don't want anybody to mess with us. So what we do is like, we're like, you know, don't mess with me. And then it's over. And that's kind of how guys are. You can just, you know, you can kick guys butt and everything's good after that. And that's kind of how guys were raised in, back in the day. And, and so I had that kind of way. So anytime 
I would never get in a fight with my wife with Yvette is I, it, it depended on the type of the fight it was, I would just be like seek and destroy. Like I'm not going to lose. I am not going to lose. And was, we were talking about our son today, um, who my son, Diego, my wife and I were talking about him. We were having some, you know, a little bit of some little trouble with the guy, you know, and I was just saying, I think he's like me in that he just, he just won't lose if you attack him, if you antagonize him, or if he thinks he's being attacked, whether he's being attacked or not. It's the perception of being attacked, right? And so um, that's kind of like how, how I was put together. And, and, and I realized that driving home. And so I was basically kind of humiliated going, what a jerk, you know, it's like you're kind of treat your wife terrible. And, and not that I'm a bad husband, but I can see like how I do things when we get into fights. And right now we're in a fight. And I just left the house. Like, I didn't care. Like, all I cared for was myself. I left the house. I went down to the beach. So I get home. I go into the bedroom. And I look. And I can see my wife's been crying. She's like, you know, on her iPad, you know, doing crossword puzzles. And I look over to her. And I say, honey, I, I, I'm just curious. Can you, can you tell me what I did? And she looks at me. And she says, yeah. And so she starts to tell me what, what I did. And then she starts to tell me what I did that week and then that year and basically our whole relationship. She's sharing with me all the things that I've done um, in our relationship. But the thing that happened that day, which to me was the coolest thing, is that I, I listened. I was like listening because I was curious. I wasn't trying to, you know, uh, defend anything. Like every once in a while I might have like tried to defend something, but I got done doing that really, really quick. And I just stayed curious. I just stayed curious. And so we get home, you know, we go out and we have a great night. We have dinner and we go and have drinks and have, go listen to music and do all that. And we get home and like I said, I journal. So about two o'clock in the morning, I get up and I go to, go to the living room and I'm sitting in the living room and I'm journaling. And for probably a couple hours and about four o'clock in the morning, my wife Yvette gets up to get a glass of water. So she's going over to get a glass of water, you know. And as she's walking back, I look to her and I say, honey, can you? Can, I have a question for you. And she's like, what is that? I said, can you tell me um, what happened? Like, why, why did you tell me everything? Like, why did you share all that stuff with me? And she says, you know, I felt like I felt safe to be able to talk to you. I felt like it was safe. And I felt like respected, like you were respecting what I was saying. And I kind of like, oh, that's pretty interesting. So I started to think about that. Like, thank you, you know, start to think about that. And as I started to like, think about like, what would it be like if somebody like had a conversation with me and they were curious, like, how would that feel for me? I think, yeah, I'd, I'd feel safe in the conversation. Like, you ever been in a conversation, guys, that, that somebody's talking to you and they're, and they're sharing stuff, or they're asking you questions? And when they ask you questions, when they're curious, like, what's that like for you, Nancy, when somebody's curious? Well, when someone, or, or, or well, I think more when I am curious and the another person is may not open to that. That is a difficult situation, right? So sometimes we feel afraid to talk because another person um, made you feel intimidated, kind of like that. So the most important always like to be open and listen. So, we, so tell me a little bit more about that, if you don't mind, Nancy. Like you, you're saying, like, so when you talk to people and they're closed off? Yeah, some people, you know, certain type of people, some, as you say, so uh, how I can say, people say, uh, I... I don't like nobody mess with me, but also when some fight or some uh, misunderstanding is on the way, these are just not open to listen to the, the another part. And yeah. the, the most important, I always say, uh, I think when you apologize, or I mean, when people apologize, there is always like, we, we, I don't know how to say it, but like, in Spanish, go and say it in Spanish, I'll translate. Okay, como, como se dice, eh, bajamos las manos, no? So she, yeah. what is she saying is that when you apologize, you bring your hands down like you're in a yeah. fighting. Yeah. And when people apologize, you bring your hands, like it de-escalates the situation. Yeah, I think more than be also be curious, but also apologize about really if we feel like I'm, I'm sorry or apologize. I, I really made you feel bad. I didn't know I, I, I want to make you feel that way. And then maybe it start to be like that. You know, I've been yeah. really certain type of people and not especially a partner. It can be friends or yeah. Foster. Anybody. Anybody. Yeah, anybody. Right. How does it feel to you when somebody is curious about what's going on with you, Nancy? Uh, okay, if it's someone very close to me, I am open. But sometimes yeah. when the, the person, if he's not close to me, I try to protect myself. Of course, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's one thing that happens is that we're constantly protecting. See, as human beings, you know, we were built on this first brain, this reptilian brain, and the idea of the reptilian brain is to fight, is what we call fight, flight, or freeze. And that's controlled by this thing called an amygdala that's in our second brain, which is our limbic brain. Basically, it's always looking for danger. So anything that, anything that we sense as danger is going to tell us to either fight, you know, run, or just freeze and, and so what's what's happening like you said when we don't feel comfortable this little amygdala is like looking for discomfort and it, it's looking for us to do one of those three different things and uh, that's, that's the that's the tough thing about about being a human being and it's the natural thing because we're so often triggered by stuff that's natural that's put in design in our just in our brains and in our bodies that's designed to keep us alive and what happens is we're in situations, we're having conversations, like let's say I'm having a conversation with my wife and she's trying to tell me how much she cares about me, but I'm mad and I don't want to hear it, right? Do you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like people are trying to tell you, like, I really care about you. And you're like, well, F you, like, I'm mad at you, that kind of thing, you know? And that's how we are as human beings, you know? Because, because we're, we're, we're taking a, a good situation and, we're, and but we're, 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 we're acting as though it's bad. All we can do is see the bad stuff or the perception of bad stuff. And what happens with curiosity is it breaks down those barriers. So when, when if, if I'm like closed off, let's say with Yvette, and, and when she's curious, then there's like the door just opens up just a little bit. There's a little bit of safety. And as long as the person's curious, then, then I will share. And it's the same thing with my wife and my kids that I do, is if they feel like attacked or something, and if I just start to be curious, like authentically curious, I'm not talking about curiosity like that. Like I'm curious, like I'm asking questions and there's an answer. Do you, all, you guys all have kids? Do you guys have kids? You have no, kids. I'm not. Yes. So, with, Jeremiah has kids and I have kids. Okay. Yeah. So, so as a kid, right, remember our parents would ask us a question, but there was only one answer and it really wasn't a question. You remember that? Yeah, like I said, so like sometimes I'll ask my kids a question and it's like, oh, no, that's the wrong answer. I know I'm asking you a question, but this is the answer you need to give me, that kind of thing. That's not curiosity. You know, when, when, we're, when we're walking down the street and we see a really nice car, car and we look at it and we go, oh, I wonder who that was in the car. That's not curiosity because that's triggered from the external. Curiosity that I'm talking about is what's triggered from inside when we're actually authentically being curious. We're like looking. We are like authentically like uh, investigating, curiously investigating, if you will. So we're, we're kind of like a detective that we're like trying to figure something out. And with curiosity, that's what happens because the brain, if you ask a question to the brain, the brain's really gonna try to figure it out. So what happens is when we're in fight mode and we start to be curious, it takes us out of our reptilian brain and puts us into our, our neocortex, which is trying to figure out what it is because you can't fight and, and try to figure out why you're fighting at the same time. They don't work together because the brain says, okay, fight, all the energy is gonna go here. Why am I fighting? That's up here and it's going, yeah, why are we fighting? You, 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 don't, you, know, you don't punch at the same time you're figuring out why am I fighting because you see you don't, you're not looking at the same place. Your whole consciousness goes to a different place. So what I discovered was curiosity was like that. And as long as I could be curious, then it would take me out of the reptilian, either the fight, which is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fight until I win. Or what happens sometimes is I don't think I'm winning the fight or I don't like it because it feels uncomfortable. I'm going to run away. Or I'm going to be frozen and just sit there and, and not communicate, not talk until the whole thing just blows away. Those are my options. Does that make sense? And that's the options for all human beings. We all have those options. So what I realized that day, and what I realized when I was talking to Yvette, and what she helped me discover is, 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 is the way to be curious. Like, how do you be curious? And it's been a practice. It's not, a, it's not like I, I'm perfect at it. I'm like far from it. But it's something I'm always trying to do, always trying to be curious. So what I did was I took the situation from my wife, and I thought, hey, what if it works with my wife because it worked that night and I kept trying it with the kids and other people. What if I tried it at work? Like, what if I tried it in my business, in my, in my mortgage business? So I started to apply that to all the different people in my mortgage business and because, you know, it, it's like if you're in sales, you know, they say that you'll, you'll capture about 10% of the, of the conversations that you have, right? It's like one out of 10. Like if you're lucky, you'll get like one out of 10 of people that you talk to that you'll that one of 10 people that you start to talk to are actually going to talk to you. And then you have a percentage of those that you're going to close. 
So I said, okay, well, let me look at my numbers. I started to look at my numbers and how many deals I lost, how many transactions I lost. And I always wondered, like, people took information from me. Like, they would call me and say, Martine, what about this? And I'd explain to them. But they'd go off and do, do business with somebody else. Have you ever had that happen with you? Oh, it yeah. happens with all of us. Yeah. You're like, wow, what happened? I just, I basically helped the next person do a sale. Because the next person didn't work as hard as I did. But I educated this person to go work with somebody else. So I got tired of that. And I said, okay, what, what can I do? Why don't I start to be more curious? And I found that my business started to, started to double and triple. And I actually would talk to less people. So I wasn't having to talk to 100 people to do 10 transactions. I was talking to 50 people and I was doing 20, 25 transactions. Because I was being curious with everybody. I wasn't making the assumptions like I knew what somebody was talking about or I knew what they wanted. I actually started to ask them. And what I started to see is that I stopped connecting with just one of the cup, like if there was a couple, right? Let's say it was a husband and a wife. Maybe I connected with the husband or maybe I connected with the wife, but I didn't connect with the other partner. Does that make sense? So as I was being curious, I was noticing that I was connecting with both people. And so what I found out and what I realized is that when I only connected with one, the other person was offended and they went off because they leave and I'd give them all kinds of information. And the one that I connected with liked me, but the other one felt offended. Go, Martin's a jerk. He ignored me the whole time. He didn't take care of me. So as I started to be curious, I started to see that like that the couples, and I knew this, but I didn't know how to interact with them. So what I did is I wasn't real comfortable and I've been, I'm good at what I do. I have good numbers. I've been really good at, at, at sales. But what happened was I would focus on the person that I connected with most. And then I'd kind of like a little bit talk to the other person. And now what I do is I can literally have conversations with, with two or three people and connect with all three of them at the same time. Because I'm being curious. Curious about the needs of everybody. Where you may have somebody that's very analytical and somebody that just wants to have fun. Well, how do, you, how do you have a conversation with people that are completely polar opposites and meet both of their needs? That's interesting, right? It's actually incredibly simple. It's really, really simple. You identify the words that they use and you talk to them in their language. It's really that simple. So as I'm talking to Jeremiah, I talk to Jeremiah in his language. As Nancy says what she says, I talk to her in her language. But we, don't, we haven't been taught that language. We haven't been taught how to find out that language. So what I started to do is just put together like what that language was. And I started to notice that people were actually speaking in these languages. And I started to write it all down. This person said this and this person said this. And I started to notice that people express themselves in, in three different domains. What they observe, what they feel, and what they need. Say it again. This is something we should write down. If you have a pen and paper, write this down. Like seriously. What you observe, what you feel and what you need. This is it, this is like the, the keys to the kingdom. But I teach, I, I go deep into the, in my course and, and teach people how to do this. So the first part is I started to notice that, that as I was observing people, they were observing me. That makes sense? So I'm watching you, Nancy, and as I, as I watch you, I notice you have long black hair. Right? right? I notice you're wearing like a sweater or something. I notice I could see like something behind you. As I see Jeremiah, I notice that there's something right behind him. There's something, you know, there's something that says something. I see is a black, is a black uh, a t shirt. As I see, as I look at Veronica, I notice that she's got like kind of like a, you know, a, a, a kind of a dress or a blouse with, with where her, her shoulders are exposed. We notice people, right? And what most people do is what they know, what, what they, what they observe, what they notice, they make it mean something. That makes sense. We make stories about everything we see. So if, if before the, before the curiosity theory, I may say, um, Oh, Nancy, she has pretty black hair. She probably has got a really good boyfriend or something. Oh, Jeremiah, he's like a bald guy. He's probably real tough, you know, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he's like, a, you know, like, and, and, and see, so I made up a story, right? And I go, oh, there's Veronica. Oh, she's so sexy with her shoulders, you know. We make up stories. Do you know what I mean? Don't we do hey, that? But, but you know what is the funny thing and the good thing? I really have a very nice boyfriend. 
<laughs> so I still got it. <laughs> yeah. So some some of my stories are right. My story about Jeremiah was wrong. My story about Veronica was right. You know. So I. And and right. what we do. This is and it's a really good point, Nancy, because what we what's happened with us over time is we've 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 been right about enough stories that we keep being right about our stories. Does that make sense? Yes. Like we've been right about our guess, what people are enough times that we're now going to keep doing that. We depend on ourselves and we believe like as human beings, we believe that we're right about what we say people are. And then we go to our death. We go, we'll put it on Facebook and we'll tell people that these people, this group of people are this way. And this group of people are this way. And then we say, Oh, and these people divide us and these people divide us. like we, we, we think we know and we speak as though we know and we think that just because we have a thought in our head we're right and we and we have the evidence because we've made it this long i've made it 54 years of course what i say is right right you know so most so of when, the times yeah well enough times that we fight for what we enough times that we fight for it right that's what I'm saying. So, so we have observations. So we see what are facts. Okay. Fact is he's wearing a black shirt, a t-shirt. That's a fact, right? It says something, Holy night on the back on, on his wall. You have black hair. Veronica has a, a red blouse. I don't even know if it's a blouse. It could be a dress, but she's wearing something red and her, and her shoulder, you can see her shoulders. Those are facts, right? Anything else is a story. Can you see that? There's a fact. This says honor. That is a that is a, 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 a light bulb with a question mark in it. Anything else is a story, right? Can you get that? So what we do, so that's the first part is observations. The second part is feelings. We have a feeling about our stories. We feel like we feel and how we figure out are our stories true? is we go inside, in, literally inside of our bodies, and we wonder how we feel. It's like, you f I think I'm right. Because if you don't feel comfortable about your story, you're going to think you're wrong, right? But if you feel comfortable with that story, literally feel, like literally energetically, emotionally feel good about that story, you go, that must be right. So what we do is we use our internal emotions, our internal feelings, to decide whether our stories are correct from our facts. That makes sense. Are you with me on that, Nancy? Yeah, I am here. Okay, yes, got it. I am Does, <laughs> and then what we do is we tie in those, we tie in everything into something we call needs, N-E-E-D-S, needs, human needs. Okay. And there's some core needs that we have like Maslow. I don't know if you guys know who Abraham Maslow is. Back in 1943, this guy named Abraham Maslow came up with this thing called the um, uh, hierarchy of needs. Basically, he said, it's all people, regardless who, all, who they are, regardless if they're Hispanic, Black, Chinese, or they're American, they're Canadian, they're from Europe, it doesn't matter where they're from. If they're tall or short, they're fat, they're skinny, um, they're, they're um, male or female, that we all have basic needs. And the needs are, are in, a, in, the, in a hierarchy of needs, which means that, that one needs, you have to meet one set of needs before you can go to the next level of needs. So before we can have love and belonging, we have to deal with, we have to deal with our, our survival. Our survival needs, our base need to survive. Literally to breathe air, to eat, to drink water. That's a survival need. And then there's safety needs, which are like having money, having a house with a roof on it, right? And then you have, and then you have like our, our love and belonging needs, which is, you know, we're in a group right here. This is, it's like, it's cool to be in this group. You know, you know what I mean? Yes. It's like we have a place to be. We have a place to come on Tuesday night and to get together and to learn something and kind of come together. You know, Jeremiah, I know you're big in church, right? You're big in your faith. And, and so, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a lot of, I would imagine, there's a lot of satisfaction when you go to church and you see the same people you saw last week or you, you see them at Bible study. Isn't that like, a, like just really great? Kind of, because I need to sell my book to multiple different people. So if I keep seeing them over and over again, you know, how many books am I going to sell? Yeah, no, no absolutely. Uh, I, I really love uh, seeing the same people over and over again. But, yeah. uh, you know, I was raised Catholic, 
And uh, every time I go to a Catholic church, you know, and this is probably sounds terrible, but all the old guys that would sit up front, I would always wonder if I was going to see him next week. But, um, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, the, the, the thing is, is it, it's, it's love and belonging. Like it's, it's like being part of an organization, being part of a group. We, we want that. But we're not going to go be a part of a group if we can't breathe, if we don't have food in our body. So the hierarchy, what happens is you have to have your, you have to have your basic needs met. And after you have those needs met, you can go higher and higher. And then and the next level need is, is our self-esteem. So that once we have our, our, our love and belonging, though that, you know, I go to church here or I part of this organization, that makes me feel good. You know, just, you know, being a part of, of Veronica's group, I think this, like, you know, I was looking at it today. Like, it, I felt good about being a part of this group, about, you know, being in this group and being able to share in this group. It met my need for, like, my self-esteem. Like, I felt good about me as a human being. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and, and so, so my, my, my survival needs, my, my house, my safety, those needs are all met. My love and belonging needs are met. And now I can go with my self-esteem. And then what's above that is self-transcendence and self-actualization. It's like giving back. So once you meet your basic needs, the higher needs are like giving back. You know, like, like, like Jeremiah's book gives back to people. He doesn't have to write a book. But at some point, I believe, and I'm just, I don't speak for you, tell me if I'm right or wrong. At some point, you, you, you gain enough information and it's time to now give back. So let me put this information in a book. Let me put my ideas in a book so that somebody else can learn from this, right? Jeremiah's book, you released it, what, a month ago or so? Uh, two weeks. Two, okay, so it's, really, yeah, it's beautiful cover, by the way. Beautiful oh, cover. Thank you so much. That was uh, $35 off of Fiverr. <laughs> That's a good thirty-five dollars spent, brother. It's fantastic. So, so he, you know, so so he puts he puts everything he's his knowledge in his book, and I would imagine just like my book is that it, it's like the the hope is that somebody takes that and their life is better as a result, right? Exactly. See, that's giving back, but we don't do that when we can't breathe. We don't do that, you know, it, when when we're dealing with our safety. So the third level, which is, is needs, is, is, that, is, is that part. And, and if we start to look at our observations and our stories, right, our facts and our stories, and we look at how we feel, those, all those things kind of swirl around together. And as we see something, as we see something happen, let's say you're at a, at a street corner and some man has a little kid and he's yanking him across the street, we're going to have a reaction to those things. Like, what's that? It could be somebody could go, you know, what's that guy doing? He's really, really rough on the kid. And somebody that doesn't like kids go, God, that kid's probably a brat. You know, we're all going to have a little story, right? And then we're going to look and see how we feel to see if that story's accurate. And then what, what if we look deeper, what we're going to see is how does that story meet my need? And this is where it's, this is where the, 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 the keys of the kingdom are. If you notice your conversations you have with people, in almost every conversation, people are going to tell you how they feel and what they need. I'm going to say that again. In almost every conversation you have with anybody, they're going to tell you how they feel and what they need. And guess what we don't listen for? How they feel and what they need. We don't listen for that because we've never been taught to listen for that. And, 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 the, and the, the problem is, is that people don't speak that people don't really speak clearly about their feelings. People don't, people don't express their feelings in a way that actually makes sense. You know, they, they, they'll, they'll say things like, you know, I don't feel like you understand me, or I don't feel like you're really being fair to me, or I don't feel like, you know, uh, I don't feel like you're being honest. And the problem with that way of thinking, and I talk that way too, the problem with that way of thinking is that we're, someone's telling us how they feel, but they're not expressing themselves as a feeling. They're not expressing themselves as an emotion. So when somebody says, uh, I feel like you're being dishonest with me. What I learned to do is I learned to say, okay, at the basic feeling, okay, Jeremiah, you and I are like, this, this is a guy. This is about the guys right here, okay? So what I did is I had to figure out basic guy feeling, okay? Not girls, not, not you girls, but the guys, okay? Because we don't like a whole lot of feelings, okay? For the most part guys. And so, so I said, okay, it feels good. We're going to call it yum. It feels bad. We're going to call it yuck. Okay. So I started to hear people talk and I started to think yum or yuck. Okay. So Nancy, when something is good, is it yum or is it yuck? 
is a jump. Yum, right? Exactly. And when it's bad, Veronica, what is it? Yuck. It's yuck. So in conversations, if you can start to identify yum and yuck at the basic part of a conversation and says, I feel, I feel, um, I feel like you're not understanding me. That is a yum or a yuck? Yuck. Yuck, right? So I know the feeling is yuck right off the top. So if I'm talking to a client, they're sitting in front of me and she says, I, I don't feel like you're understanding me, Martine. I'm saying she is having a yuck experience with me. Her observation, what she's seen, what she's observing and the story that she's making is not a positive story. And she's telling me her emotion, okay? I don't feel like you're, I don't feel like you understand me. Let's say, I don't feel like you understand me. Yuck, understanding. So she's telling me her feeling is yuck and her need is for what? To be understood. Does that make sense? And people are always, always saying that. So what I did is I learned to, I learned to listen for that stuff that people do. And then I learned to train people to do that. Train, literally train people to listen for conversations that are happening right in front of us like this that we don't listen to. And so what I teach and what we teach in the curiosity theory isn't something you don't know. It's exactly what you already know, except we train you to like to be able to observe and to recalibrate the conversations that you're in, in a way that you can be effective with those conversations incredibly effective with those conversations. Because if I'm sitting across from Jeremiah and Jeremiah says, I don't feel like you're paying attention to me. He's telling me, yuck, pay attention to me. You get that? What do we do when someone says, Jeremiah, I don't feel like you're paying attention to me. What do we do? We go into fight, flight, or freeze. We go into defense mode or we go into attack mode. Think about that. Nancy, if I told you, you and I are having a conversation, I said, I don't really think like you're paying attention to me. What are you going to do? I, I didn't understand what you said. You, you, you were speaking too fast. Okay. So let's <laughs> say... In Spanish? In Spanish? In Spanish? Uh, if you can. Um, okay. I, I don't know that I can say the feeling thing because okay. I, I try to speak more proper in Spanish, so I, don't, can't, I can't really do yeah. that. But let's say you and I are in a transaction together, a business transaction. Right. And I say to you, in a way that's not a very nice way. Nancy, I don't think you're paying attention to me. I don't think you're listening to me. How do you feel? Uh, I'm going to feel distracted. Yum or yuck? Yum or yuck? yuck. Yum or yuck? Yuck. Okay, exactly. Okay. So when you feel yuck, what does your little reticular activator tell you to do? Uh, put attention, ask. No, ask. It no, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. It doesn't. It tell, in, in good situations, it does that. But what happens are, and it happens for everybody, most people, and I'd say like, like literally the vast majority of people, and I can't tell you the statistic, but I'm saying way in the high 90%, okay? That most people get defensive. Yeah. You're not, oh, not paying attention to me? Oh, oh. And what we do is we make it about ourselves. Oh, I'm not paying attention? Oh, I need to pay attention, you know, or whatever, you know, we do that but we don't speak to the person about what they just asked for. We, we, we make that about us. And even though they're saying it to us, they're telling us what they need. And we say things like, I, 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 but people aren't asking us for I, they're asking us for them. It's true. Does that make sense? People don't ask us for our opinion. They ask us to give them what they want. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't feel like you're paying attention to me. The person said, I don't feel like you're paying attention to me. And then what we say immediately is I. And that's not what the person was talking about. Are you with me on that? Right. Okay. So in conversations, people want to talk about themselves. I don't want to talk about us. Nobody wants to talk about me. We want to talk about themselves. And in business, we, if, we, if we listen to that, then we're going to be more effective. If in our relationships we listen to that, we're going to be more effective because we're, we're literally listening to people for what they're asking for. And we can actually start to separate 
what they observe from what the facts are, okay? So if Jeremiah is talking to me and I tell him something like that, like, I don't feel like you're paying attention to me. Jeremiah could have been paying 100% attention to me. He could have been completely focused on me. But what's in, the, what's in my observation, what I'm observing and what story I'm making up based on my observation is that he's not paying attention to me, even if he is paying attention to me. Have you ever been accused of doing something you didn't do, but you could not explain yourself out of it? Yes, I'm married. <laughs> I got to tell you, this is what I wrote this morning. Okay, I got to read this to you guys. Okay, ready? <laughs> this is what I wrote. I'm not kidding. This is 742 this morning, 726 this morning, April 30th. I said, I thought, when you're married, you give suggestions to problems and they are openly accepted and appreciated. I was really wrong about that. And I don't mean that as a dig to anybody because I don't listen to any, I don't listen any better, you know? <laughs> but the thing is, is that, is that people are talking about themselves. And this morning, my wife needed me to listen to her for her. And I gave her a suggestion and that's not what she asked for. Ooh. You know what I mean? Because she wasn't asking for that. And so I wasn't being curious. Okay. Does that make sense? It does so make sense. Had I been okay, curious. We'll at the end of the hour and I want to give a space for people to ask questions. Oh. Ask Remember? away. And uh, I, what I want to say, I want to say it's my personal experience with you since I met you before you wrote your book. Yeah. Yeah. Right before I wrote it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, I always show up at people's life right before the break. <laughs> um, you sure do. It's not funny. It's true. Uh, with anyone I've ever met, like, I'm pretty sure. I don't know where you guys are in life, but like Nancy, I haven't ever tried to give you a session, so I don't know where you are with that. But, um, but you know that I, that's, that's happened with Brian. That's why I know for sure. Yeah. Um, and with Jeremiah, I met him right before he finished his publishing his book. So yeah, I that's a, that's pretty that. interesting. No, it's not. So no, it's interesting. No, to me, it's interesting. This is the thing. So I want to express something to you, Veronica. I want to share something with you. I, you notice, I actually, if you, give you me notice how I said this is interesting, and she said no, it's not. See, that's the communication I'm talking about. I said it was interesting. So from my perspective, it's interesting. She's now saying from her perspective, that's where the fights start. Okay, you get that? I okay. said, it's interesting. She said, no, it's not. And it's, it's funny what, that I meant to explain what it's about. And I, That's I, what we want to do. That yeah. is exactly what we want to do. We want to explain what we mean. We constantly want to do that. That is where curiosity, that's where we bump heads. That's where conflict happens. <laughs> Yuck. Go ahead. So, go ahead, Veronica. Thank you for making that um, point. So what I want to say to you is that your your level of communication completely shifted after that book, like because we 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 had a moment where we kind of dropped apart and then we reconnected and it kind of happened like a couple times a year it happens that way we reconnect and then we disconnect and um, you completely change the way you communicate and interact with people I've noticed that a lot so that 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 that. Uh, process completely change your life. I, I've seen that. So I want to, I want to just acknowledge that. Thank you. So uh, it, it's really, that's a really cool point. So because in Jeremiah, you just wrote a book. So what happened before the book is I didn't have to be clear about the book. And then once yeah. I wrote the book, I had to then be clear about the book. Hyper-focused you had to become hyper-focused. So just like you said, Ronnie, it's very good observation. So once you get, like clarity comes from a, a, a purpose that you're trying to, you're trying to get a, a point across or a purpose that you have. And once you find this purpose or you find your mission, we then, if, if we're smart, then what we do is we learn to be clear about that mission. We learn to, how can we communicate that in a way that's effective, which are needs. Being clear is, is a need, is a human need. So my need, to sell my book, my need to get my course out there, mm -hmm. I had to have clarity. But when I didn't have that, I didn't have a need for clarity. I would just talk about stuff. Yep. Right? But like you said, then you become hyper-focused because you have something. So like, like Veronica was saying, she goes, you know, she, I met her when she didn't have her, her, her um, she wasn't as, as, as powerful, as secure as she is right now. She was developing 
her what she was. The moment, like literally the moment that she figured out what it was, the clarity all fa fall into place because the need to be clear about what it is you're doing is, is whether you eat or don't eat. So the need <laughs> rises, the need rises because you need to be clear if you're, if you're willing to, and you're willing to do that. Go ahead, Veronica. I believe that actually your life purpose is always with you and you're always doing that without understanding it. Mm -hmm. When I met you, Martina, I told you like your gift is in people and you didn't want to hear me and like we even got into conflict in 2018 because Martin, we're not ready to hear that. Uh, Jules, it's so nice to have you. It's, it, it was, you were not ready to hear it. So very often we have our life purpose on our nose and we don't understand it. When I used to be in corporate, I would always show up right before the company and I go worse. And I hated it. I'm like, why can't I go the other way around? Well, because I'm a breakthrough specialist. So I, and I usually would not last in the company for a long time anyway. And so I would usually live right after that somewhere. But I would always show up in the breakthrough moment in every company ever I've ever showed up. And uh, because that's what I'm supposed to do. And I've been a big lesson to a lot of managers. Um, not that I try to be a lesson. So I, uh, so I show up at people's, at people's breakthroughs because that's what I do. I help people to, to figure out what they are in a breakthrough moment and get their life together. Exactly. And so when you understand yeah. things with who you are and what is very next for you, you could rise to your greatness and step to the next mm -hmm. level. And I met you, Martin, right when you were doing that. Because yeah. things give you purpose. Like Jeremiah, when we talked, like, Jeremiah, you could see that he's going to be very accomplished and successful. And Jeremiah has that gift of connecting with people. Like Jeremiah knows everybody around my Facebook friends. It's crazy. Like he, I don't know when he has time for that, but he connects mm. with everyone. Like I've noticed. <laughs> and he lives really in cool. Alabama. Jeremiah lives in Alabama. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm part of right Alabama? Up. It's called Orange Beach. It's a uh, it's a small city. I'm a, actually a corrections officer here, and that's where I wrote the book. So, <laughs> I, I run into a lot of personality conflicts. My um my coach is uh, from Alabama. He's a roll tight guy. Oh, me too. Yeah. Uh, both of my uh, my in laws graduated from Alabama. Yeah, he did. Uh, his name's Clay Green. Look him up. He's amazing. Um, as a matter of fact, he's, he's going to be. Gonna be, he's here in town now, so he's going to be here at the house this weekend. Um, the the whole idea of curiosity really is um, is it, it it opens up so many different doors. It just it, it and when you're curious about you know people's observations, if you're curious about what you observe and what facts and what stories you're making and what you're feeling and what needs, the whole world changes. So I just want to encourage you guys to kind of start like looking at that. Listen for for when people talk about what they need, listen to the word need and listen to what's after that and listen to people, how they express their feelings and notice that they don't even for the most part, express their feelings as a feeling. They're typically expressing them as a metaphor, as a story. So what happens is immediately you get to hear the story that they're making. You get to know if it's yum or yuck, right? Cause they're telling you yum or yuck. And then you, if you listen for the need, then you could you you basically know what's going on with a person. If you're in, you said you're in you're in. Um, what do you do, Jeremiah? You said you're you work. Oh, for, what do you? Martin, I'm, I'm a, let's open for a few minutes for Jeremiah and then say ask question. If okay. that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremiah, I'm do a, you have any questions? First, how do you look 28 at the age of 32? Uh, <laughs> second, uh, no, you know, I'm a corrections officer here at the, the jail here in town. Uh, and that's uh, during the fall, nothing happens. You know, we have a bunch of snowbirds and it's, you know, it's a beach town. It's touristy. So that's, that's how I've had enough time to write the, uh, the books. That's and cool. I'm working on the second one now. Uh, well, you know, the book's about uh, 17s so that go to a different world. And uh, they're sent there by God to save an angel from a demon king. But when they get back, the real trouble starts. High school. 
so you know it's 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 about these kids and how they adjust with uh with living for christ in a world that's you know turning against them yeah. which you know it's always kind of been against christ anyway yeah uh, but uh and that's that's what i try to give to kids because i used to help out with the youth here i don't have much of a chance to do it now since i work nights but uh that's that's one you know i wanted to make it also grandiose in a different world also veronica you are so cool what did i do <laughs> you're just cool yeah boom done <laughs> i want to let you know drop the mic that's it She's just cool. Every time you talk to I'm going to be sexist. I'm the marker. I'm the pen. to JMI, I'm just... Have kids. <laughs> what, uh, Nancy, do you have any questions? Do you have any... No, I, I just, I, I um, listen what you, the message you try to trans, transmit to everyone. And one of the things that sometimes we are not curious about people, and that you said, uh, uh, important is to be open and feed our curiosity to start to interact with others. That's cool. I said that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way other people say what they think. I like it because it's really cool. I'm like, that is a great way to say it that I say it, you know, you know what I mean? Like people say things so good and I'm like, I'm going to use that. Well, sometimes we don't uh, perceive ourselves the way others perceive us. So I know for me, I do a lot of Facebook lives. And awesome. it's interesting that I've noticed that anytime I do Facebook Live, I think one way. And when I watch it, it's almost like 90% opposite of what I thought. So I thought. If I thought it's my best, sexiest day, it's going to be the most ugliest video I've ever had. Yeah. If I thought I speak super slow, I realize that people need to buckle up. And, and so it, it's interesting to see, like I had a day when I thought I was doing meditation and I realized people didn't have time to even close their eyes. Yeah. And so when you go back and see yourself, like for me, it's one of the most effective exercises of kind of accepting mm -hmm. myself because I always make a point to go and watch my videos a few times because it's completely not what I thought I have. And then it's very important because when I do sales calls or when I talk to any of you guys, I think I do one thing and you guys are going to receive completely different things. And that is the that's where the curious investigating comes in. So we teach two different things. We teach two, well, we teach a lot of stuff in the curiosity theory. We teach two distinctions. One of them is honestly expressing. So you honestly want to express your emotions in a way that you take responsibility and what your needs are. And then you want to curiously investigate for what's going on with other people. So like in the corrections department, like we talked to cops, I was talking to a cop as a clarent today and he works with youth and we were talking about that and he's show, teaching them about curiously investigating. And it's like when, when somebody, when somebody's coming to you, like curiously investigate, like, like what, what are they observing? What story did they make? You know, they're making up stories left and right. Typically they're not good stories yeah. and they're typically yuck stories, right? Yeah. Well, what's the need that, that they're trying to say? What is the need? Doesn't mean you're going to be able to solve it. But something happens really magical when you can nail somebody's need. When you can when you can get somebody's need, it's almost like they go, oh, you got me. You get me. Yeah, well, they want self-worth. And you're putting them into a box with other people that have no self-worth. But they were taught that their self-worth was in these drugs, was in these guns, within this, in this violence yeah. by other people that didn't have self. It's, it is a huge cycle yeah. where we then stick them into a box where they are forced – with these other people that don't know their self-worth and they have to feed off each other. And that's how they build a friendship, a, a bond, yes. because they're feeding off of that loneliness. Uh, and, and they're like, oh, when we get out of here, we're gonna do drugs. We get out of here, we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna do what my uncle's doing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. I, no, it, that's exactly right. That's exactly, think about, you know, I, always, I, they, I use the example of, of graffiti. You know, oh, yeah. why, does, why does somebody do graffiti? What's the need? It's expression. It's also to be known. Mm -hmm. Like I want someone to know I'm, I'm, it's for significance. Like I want someone to know I was alive. I, I need to have my name. So there's like, I mean, I have some meaning in my life. It means something. You know, you write your name, it's on a wall. It's like, Hey, and, and we have like, you know, the kids, they have like this idea that everybody's going to go by and they're going to know it's that person. Yeah. You know, and it's a need, it's a need to be known in this world, to be important in this world. Now, 
for the person that owns the 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 the, the, the property that someone's writing, their need is to have their property look good. So we have conflicting needs at the same exact same time. So the one person goes, well, you're a jerk because you did this and you're going to go to jail. And the other person, I was just trying to get known. So is, are, is somebody doing something right or somebody doing nothing? No, that's where the judgment comes in. So what, devoid of judgment, if we take judgment out of it, we can see that there's a self-expression for one person to have a, a building that looks beautiful. And another person says, I just want to be known. And they come together in this area where it's like, hmm, you know, for it doesn't meet everybody's needs. I, I want you to, let's, I want to satisfy my own curiosity. I yeah. want to know who that ZL person is. So if you can, if you can look at the video and open up your mic, if you are still here, I really just want to hear from you. It's Denka. Oh, hi, hi Denka. How are you? So Denka is all the way from, um, from Canada. Oh, wow. I tell well, you, part. I have people all over the world. It's really cool. Um, Denka, do you have any questions? No, I would like to say thank you for the for t today it was really good it was like really simple but also like really refreshing and Thank like you. really good message like to remind us like the it's simple like observe feel and need mm -hmm. like that was that's cool what i'd like to do is give you guys um you know if you guys would connect with me i'd like to give you guys the book and i could either give it to you as an audio book or a or a, oh, a pdf dude. I, I got to do some mowing tomorrow, so that'd be awesome if there's an audio. Yeah. So just do me a favor. Send me, um, just, you know, in Facebook, just send me a private message. Martin, um, but don't friends? do it in the message thing. Don't do it in the message thing, because I want to make sure the people that are on this, they get it, because I sell the book to everybody else. <laughs> oh, thank you. Are, are, are thank we friends, you so though, much. outside of... Well, yeah, I think I think I think you and I are friends, Jeremiah. Okay. Yeah, Nancy, just s send a friend request and and then and then just send me a private message, and I'll send Ask you. And let me know if you want the audio or if you want to so read. I, which yeah, it's Martin Lopez for you guys. Okay. I think and I'll in the in the feed, you can find me in that feed. Yeah, and I'm uh, he's in the feed. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Thank hey, you, Veronica. Thank you. Thank Who's, you so much, for you guys. Do you, you guys have any more questions, or we good? Who's the ZL person? It's Denka. Denka, are, is she? She's also from uh, P Paruska or uh, Russia? Oh no, she, uh, Denka, where are you from? I forgot. Slovakia. Slovakia. Cool. Uh, so, like Yeksimash. Dobre. Dobre. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I don't. I don't know that much Czech. Uh, Dobre is like in Ukrainian. I speak Ukrainian. Kavala. <laughs> All right, Pika. You guys have a good one. I am an international creature. I, I mean, I, I have, I've had, uh, I think last week or week before we had, I had a guy who connected with me on Instagram. He wakes up at four o'clock in the morning in, in Uganda, I believe. That's what I'm talking about. Like we sometimes forget the significance of how and how privileged we are that the people no. don't have access to that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Nancy, yes. you rock. You're the best. Oh, thank you for the message. Thank you, thank you for the kind message, Jeremy. I appreciate it a lot. Hey, not a problem. My Spanish is terrible, but Deus te bendiga. Hey, you guys have a great day. Goes with me. Oh, I love that one. God bless you. Thank you oh. so much. Have an amazing, amazing day. And I'll see you all next Tuesday. So same time next Tuesday. Have an thank amazing you, everyone. Day. Thank you, Martina. I will keep in touch with you guys. Look forward to it. Thanks, Nancy. Take care. Bye-bye.